my distinct privilege and honor to formally introduce Dr. Peter Rutland. Dr. Peter Rutland is the Colin and Nancy Campbell Professor of Government at Wesleyan University, where he has taught since 1989. He previously taught at the University of, University of Texas, Austin, and at the University of London. He has a BA from Oxford and a PhD from the University of York in the UK. He is the author of two books and editor of four others. His research focuses on the political economy of contemporary Russia, ranging from energy policy to nationalism. He is associate editor of Russian Review and also uh, the editor-in-chief of uh, Nationalities paper, the Journal of the Association for the Study of Nationalities. And this evening, he's going to share his insights with us about the security energy of uh, Russia. And the title of his talk is uh, Russia's Energy Strategy, What Next? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Rutland. Thank you for uh, the invitation. I'm very happy to be here, not least because we uh, Dr. Laskin earlier talked about a short commute. I also have a short commute to Quinnipiac because I live in New Haven. So I'm very pleased to finally uh, have an opportunity to come and, and see this uh, great institution from the inside. And uh, it's getting towards the end of, of a long and fruitful day for you all, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to come this morning because I had a class, and with all of those snow days that we had earlier in the year, I couldn't afford to miss any more classes, um, but I was able to listen to the panel this afternoon, which was very informative and I think very sensible in the sense that um, I didn't hear the usual kind of polemics and uh, off the, off the tang tangential comments, which all too often creep into discussions of the Ukraine crisis. But um, should I use this microphone or just this one? Uh, microphone, sorry, yeah, because I have a, a radio mic for the... Uh, the video. Um, so thankfully, nothing I want, to, I want to say about energy was really covered in the panel this afternoon, so I, I'm not worried about uh, too much overlap. What I'll try to do is just make basically five points to give a kind of general framework of analysis for thinking about the role of energy in Russia's political system and its economic future. So just kind of five very simple general points. Um, the first point starts off with an anecdote, inevitably, which is that uh, two years ago, there was an annual competition for computer programmers that's organized uh, by IBM at Baylor University in Texas. And they have a, a competition to uh, undergraduate students all over the world. Teams of four programmers are given a number of tasks to, to complete in like uh, 30 minutes. And they have to, the winner is the one that completes the largest number of tasks without any mechanical aids, just a piece of paper and a pencil. And uh, the winner in 2013 was the St. Petersburg Optics uh, Mechanical Institute. They've won, I think, three times in the past 10 years. And uh, that year, for the first time, no American team finished in the top 10. Uh, there were four Russian teams in the top 10. Uh, tenth place uh, was taken by a Russian team, the um, Altai State University Mathematics Department. Altai is a province way out there on the border with uh, Mongolia. And eleventh place, the place that followed Altai, was uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Right. So the, the point of that story is that some residues of the Soviet educational system are still alive and well in various corners of the Russian Federation. So there are still brilliant mathematicians and brilliant minds coming out of Russia. And the puzzle is, why can't those scientific skills translate into an innovation economy, a dynamic, innovative, science-based, value-added economy? Uh, and so the first point I'm making is this point about Russia being uh, cursed by its resources. The fact, as was mentioned earlier, that 70% of the export revenue comes from oil and gas, the fact that 50% of the government 
budget uh, comes from oil and gas revenues, the fact that something like probably 25% of GDP comes from oil and gas and related transport of oil and gas activities. Um, that, uh, that legacy of the, just the ge geological wealth of Russia uh, puts an incredible burden on the country's economic prospects because it skews the economy in a way that we've seen in countless economies around the world. It skews the economy towards uh, resource dependency and the resource curse and all the pernicious effects that follow from that of uh, overvalued exchange rate, um, corruption in the political system, and so on and so forth. And so the Russian government is fully aware of this. You know, the Russians are not happy being a petro state. I would say, in fact, that they're in a state of psychological petro denial. They, they pretend that they're not as dependent on oil and gas as they actually are. So they go around thinking that they're not. And the government has been trying for the past 10 years or so to promote a more uh, innovation-based economy with projects such as the Skolkovo Business Center and uh, revamping at considerable political cost to the Academy of Sciences system to try and make it more market-friendly and more decentralized. So the government is doing what it can, and it's throwing a lot of money at the problem. We're talking billions of dollars invested in these various research schemes. And as Lauren Graham from, from MIT has shown, uh, it's all failing. It's all water under the bridge, money poured into the sands or whatever. It's not working. And uh, Russia is kind of stuck with this petrostate future, I'm afraid. Uh, the irony is, uh, among other things, they haven't even been very good at investing in R&D in the oil and gas sector. Um, they had the infrastructure there from Soviet times, although a lot of it was in Baku and was lost when Azerbaijan became an independent country. But they haven't even really invested very much in uh, oil and gas technology. In the Soviet past, they, they, were, they were innovators. Um, uh, fracking, they, you know, fracking was done by Soviet engineers uh, back in the 50s. Also, there were some prototypes uh, in the US. So fracking was nothing that new. It was a Soviet engineer, as Thane Gustafsson's book, uh, Wheel of Fortune, explains. It was Soviet engineers who developed the turbo drill, which is putting a small um, uh, motor for the drill at the, at the bit end so it can be more flexible, which makes horizontal drilling possible. So again, the Soviets were not slackers in oil and gas technology innovation, but the uh, heavy hand of the state, uh, the disrespect for entrepreneurship that was deeply embedded in the Soviet system, carried over to post-Soviet Russia. Um, intellectuals want to be brilliant scientists, but if they want to be entrepreneurs, they know they have to get out of Russia. They have to go to Silicon Valley, go to the West, start, start over. And so that's my first general point, is that the, the, the resource-cursed economy uh, severely constrains Russia's uh, long-term growth, growth pro uh, prospects. If Russia had no oil and gas at all, uh, you can argue they, they'd have a better chance of capitalizing on that scientific legacies of the Soviet period and creating a real open entrepreneurial economy. But I think the combination of the the, the Soviet curse plus the oil curse, in other words, the, the combination of the legacy of political authoritarianism and centralization from the Soviet period, plus the geological economic facts of oil and gas dependency, mean that the Russian government is kind of trapped in that path of economic development. And um, I don't see any, any easy way out. And again, in the Q&A, we can come back to talk in more detail about more specific aspects of, of growth prospects in the oil and gas sector. Uh, the second concept I wanted to bring out and lay on the table is the concept of the energy superpower. Okay. So if the political consequence, the, if the economic consequences of oil and gas dependency are uh, skewed economic development, increased inequality, regional and social, and uh, slower growth rates, and more volatile exposure to market fluctuations, uh, the political dimension of oil and gas dependency uh, can be captured by this concept of the energy superpower. So the basic idea here is quite intuitive, and unfortunately I think wrong, but it's still powerful intuitive appeal, is that if you are uh, one of the top 
three energy producers in the global economy, if you are pumping out you know, close to 10% of the world's oil supply, if you are responsible for 30% of Europe's natural gas needs, uh, there must be some strings at, uh, attached to that economic muscle, that energy presence that you can pull, you can yank when you want to. So the energy superpower concept is that you must be able to convert energy wealth into political influence. Right? That seems to be logical kind of thing. Um, and we do indeed see, you know, there have been plenty of cases where Russia does seem to have used its energy muscle to try to influence neighboring countries in particular, Ukraine, the shutdowns in 2006, 2009 of the gas uh, flow, um, various efforts in uh, Lithuania and Latvia to use shutoffs of energy to try to influence the privatization of various energy infrastructure assets. Um, so that's the kind of um, uh, de default view, I guess, in terms of uh, realist international relations theory would be that energy is just another tool in the toolbox. It's a, it can be used to influence neighbors. Adam Stolberg wrote, I think, the best book uh, making that case and analyzing Russia's behavior. Um, but I'm not convinced. I think when you look at the record, there's actually very few cases where Russia's energy weapon didn't blow back in its face. So using the energy weapon to, to muscle Turkmenistan and like giving Turkmenistan really bad price for the natural gas that it was buying, Russia was buying from Turkmenistan and then selling on to Ukraine, um, that just pushed Turkmenistan into the arms of the Chinese. So after 2009, Turkmenistan builds a pi an export pipeline all the way across Central Asia to China. Nobody knows what price they're getting from the Chinese, but I'm sure it's a really lousy price. Um, but the Turkmens are stuck with that now, because once you've built that pipeline, you're locked in. You see. So Russia's behavior, trying to be a kind of clumsy energy superpower, I think has arguably backfired. And we see the same story with Ukraine, ultimately, that it ends up with Ukraine being pushed kind of further into the hands of the, the West. Um, so I, I'm a skeptic about the energy superpower argument. And I did write a paper last year with a student who compiled a, a, a database of binary country trade statistics uh, with like 26 different countries from Russia. And he proved the, the old gravity model uh, still holds. The gravity model just argues that trade is uh, the product of uh, size of GDP times distance between the two capitals of the two countries. Very crudely simple model, but uh, it works globally and it works even for Russia. Even for Russia with its peculiar geography, uh, vast expanse, uh, and even for Russia with its oil and gas dependency. So I think that was a quite um, convincing finding that um, uh, economics uh, is independent of politics. I would say, and there's little evidence that Russia's, yeah, they, they do charge different prices for gas to different countries in Europe, depending on various complex factors, mysterious factors. But in the long run trade statistics, those political maneuverings kind of wash, uh, come out in the wash. And the, the basic logic of if you're close to another country, you will trade with them, irrespective of the political uh, machinations of the leaders, seems to hold true. Um, so that, those two first points, the resource curse argument affecting Russia's uh, economic development and the energy superpower argument addressing Russia's ability to project power internationally, those both pertain to the national level. So those are kind of national interest type arguments. But what I want to do in the third point is to um, get away from that kind of national interest black box approach and to open up the Russian polity and have a look at uh, a more various, varied range of, of actors, right? So the third point is the role of corporations, the role of uh, business interests, okay? Because the privatization uh, that took place in the 1990s produced uh, a quite plural range of ownership structures. There were, you know, about 15 oil companies created and the, gas, the state gas monopoly remained a single company, Gazprom, uh, but it was formed as a state corporation with some degree of autonomy from the government. And uh, 
And those companies were all uh, encouraged to, to go out and function as uh, profit maximizing businesses, to develop ownership structures, to float shares on international markets, to uh, borrow money on international markets, to uh, d adopt international accounting standards, and so on and so forth. Right? Now, it's true, of course, that in the Putin era after 2003 onwards, that the state uh, r reigns in th those corporations and turns them into state corporations with government officials being put on the board of those companies. However, I think the point still holds that those companies were expected to perform on an international global stage. And they were encouraged to go out and develop partnerships and uh, uh, downstream asset acquisition. So you've got the, you know, the Luca Oil, which is a private company, not a state-owned company, uh, being encouraged to uh, take part in oil industry in the Iraq, Iraq after the invasion and uh, buying the uh, Getty chain of gas stations in the US. And so those, they are state corporations and they are subject to Putin's political whims when he wants to exercise them. But for most of the time, those state corporations are being encouraged to compete and become kind of national champions of Russia in the global energy market. Right? So the logic of the energy companies has to follow what they read in the, in the Financial Times and not what they're reading uh, in, in the Russian propaganda media kind of thing, put it that way. Um, and so there's a kind of conflict of interest, right? That Gazprom, Luke Oil, uh, and even Rosneft, they have to operate according to the standards of international oil business. If they want to get partnerships with Total, with Exxon, with BP, they have to find a way of working with those companies and thinking like those companies. The same would be true for the Chinese oil companies. So the the interests of those companies as organizations are different from the interests of Russia as a great power, whatever exactly that is. And so I, th I think we see in various crises that the company's logic differs from the uh, national interest logic, certainly the national interest logic as interpreted by the Security Council and the, the force ministries, the Siloviki. And so this is a, a complexity, I think, a pluralism within the Russian system, which gives us some grounds for optimism, I would say, or not assuming that Russia is a single entity with a single block of interests. Um, now, from an optimistic take to a more pessimistic take, my fourth point in terms of adding layer, another layer of complexity is the question of corruption. Because it's not simply that we've got national interests and corporate interests. We also have the interests of uh, clans or cliques uh, at the top of the political system attached to Mr. Putin. Right? Um, and um, the Russian political system is very weakly institutionalized. It's a very personalized system. First Boris Yeltsin and his family with a capital F, and now Mr. Putin with his Ozero Dacha collective, this group of buddies, judo training uh, uh, club people who uh, pooled, their, pooled their money and built some uh, modest at that time dachas in a cooperative near St. Petersburg. So many of those guys now, people like Gennady Timchenko would be the primary example, are now uh, multi-billionaires. Just a coincidence that Putin has such talented friends, I guess. Um, and uh, Tim Timchenko is a remarkable story that he started off uh, as an oil trader for a uh, Kirishi uh, oil refinery near, near St. Petersburg. And then suddenly, a couple of years later, he's responsible for selling one third of all Russian oil exports on global markets kind of thing. And, um, uh, and we see a similar story in the trade with, with Ukraine that for some reason Gazprom, a state corporation in Russia, couldn't simply sell gas to Naftohar as a state corporation in Ukraine. That would be too simple, right? Instead, they go through third parties. They go through shadowy organizations, Ros Ukranergo and Itera, that are kind of registered in the Cayman Islands. Nobody's quite sure who the beneficial owner really is. Um, there are kind of mafia guys in, involved in all of this. And, Th th this has happened, there have been several iterations of this. They would close one down, and then a couple of years later, it would start up again with a different company. And obviously, there's massive rent seeking going on. So obviously, the use of these third parties is leaching money away from the state corporations and socking it in Swiss bank accounts for the benefits of the 
the kleptocratic elite, to use Karen DeWish's phrase. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it, it's not just that uh, Russia doesn't act always in national interest. It's not just that it acts in the interests of some of these state corporations. It also acts in the interests of very small groups of men who are looting the treasury, both of Russia and Ukraine. Right. So that's, that's another layer of complexity. And how Putin balances these conflicting goals, national interest, corporate interest, and the logic of capitalism, and private enrichment, I have no idea how he balances those. those. But this adds to the unpredictability of Russia's present and Russia's future, because who, who knows which logic is, is at work in any particular um, circumstance. And, uh, I would add an interesting concept to this uh, that Margarita Belmaceda has developed. It's not just a problem of rent-seeking elites, elites trying to extract revenue from uh, international trade of Russia's resources. It's also um, what she calls the creation of rent swamps, that in order to extract the rents, you want to keep uh, the trade networks and the economic structure as murky as possible. So you want to make sure the rule of law and transparency don't really take ho hold. And so this is why they like to create places like Transnistria in Moldova, or unfortunately Donbass now in Ukraine, because these are kind of pockets of illegality where all kinds of nefarious transactions can go on, and nobody really has a kind of clue who's in charge or who's benefiting. So the argument is that Russia, Russia's elite at least, has this kind of vested interest in um, creating these kind of black holes in the international system through which resources are flowing one way and money's flowing the other way and not all the money gets back to the treasury in Moscow. So that's my uh, fourth point, I think. So the fifth and final point is that that's not the whole story either, that uh, another level of players in the game are uh, regional elites and ordinary Russian people. Right? Because um, Russia isn't a democracy uh, in the sense of having competitive elections or a free press, but it is a society where the regime re relies more on consent than, than coercion, right? than terror. Right? So there is a kind of social contract between Putin and the people along the lines of we, we keep your uh, living standards rising and in return you, you stay away from politics. That's the kind of deal. Right, which Putin has forged. Yeltsin wasn't able to deliver that because the oil price was low in the 1990s, the economic system was in chaos, so living standards were declining and then stagnant. But under Putin, year after year, living standards rose 6 7% a year, the economy was growing 5 or 6% a year, so the social contract was, was, was working. And energy is key to the Russian social contract because that main player, Gazprom, comes into play. So what happens is that the domestic price of natural gas is probably about a third of the, of the market price, the price that Gazprom could get if they sold that gas to Europe. Right? And that benefits uh, consumer households and it benefits uh, metals producers. The metals billionaires get cheap energy to run their aluminum uh, mills and so on. Um, and the cheap gas is also necessary to generate electricity, which is available to a broader range of industrial and domestic consumers. And so the, this model of cross-subsidization required Gazprom to take the profits it's making from exports to Europe and then kick some of them back to, to Russian consumers and to other Russian industrial sectors. Right? And through this model, the, they were able to keep unemployment quite low, so unemployment's only like 6%, and they're able to keep living standards rising, and they're able to keep the pensioners from protesting on the streets, and kind of the system was, was working. Right? Um, the prob there were several problems with that. One was that um, there was gross underinvestment in the electricity sector. Right? So nobody had been investing in the, in the renewing the power generation system. So the whole system was kind of falling apart. Right? And they wanted to privatize the the Rao Yes, the electricity company, so that there could be um, new investment in the sector. And Anatoly Chubais, the privatization star from the 1990s, was put in charge of that. And he, uh, yeah, I'm going to finish shortly. Um, and he took eight years, took from basically from 1990, 
eight until 2000, that's 10 years, 2008, before they managed to structure uh, uh, the creation of regional energy companies. Uh, and they did have foreign uh, companies interested in buying in, right? So the kind of, it was kind of working, this strategy, and then the 2008 crisis hit, and suddenly the money evaporated and the price of energy collapsed, and so the privatization strategy was basically dead on arrival. And so they've, they haven't been able to dig themselves out of that hole yet, so they do have this still persisting long-run problem of lack of investment in the electricity generation sector, and they have this urgent need for massive investments to rebuild that uh, base, energy base of the domestic economy. And, um, and this, uh, so to wrap things up so we can have time for a QA, and a the um, situation then I think looks rather bleak uh, from the point of view of economic development and from the point of view of political development because this Russian system, the political economy of energy uh, being such a central part of it, it is kind of uh, rigid and stable, but it's not capable of generating growth, I think. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a rigid but kind of a brittle uh, system. And things like the 2008 crisis, uh, energy, uh, electric, uh, economic crisis, and things like the Crimean crisis and the sanctions that the West imposed on Russia, particularly the sectoral sanctions, uh, excluding certain banks and oil companies from international markets and international cooperation. Um, they're going to hit Russia um, very hard, uh, especially in the long run, in terms of you know, even the heads of Rosneft talk about a 25% fall in uh, long-term oil production because of the, the Western sanctions basically shutting off Russia from the, particularly the offshore technology they need to develop in the Arctic Sea region. So I think the even if the, the sanctions are lifted, I think the structural problems of Russia's political economy will remain. But the sanctions are, are I think, there's debate uh, among the specialists about how effective sanctions ever are and how effective they are in the Russian case. But I think it's, been, it's clear that it's imposed much heavier burden on the Russian economy than Putin expected. And um, that still, however, that hasn't altered his political behavior. So. Um, I'll end at this point and invite questions. And um, I'm afraid I have a childcare obligation, so I have to leave at quarter to five, uh, or I'm in deep trouble. So, uh, yes, sir. You uh, touched upon it briefly. What did you say Russia's uh, response was to the financial crisis of 2008 that led to the plummeting of oil prices and the decrease in demand for oil? Yeah, the financial crisis of 2008 caused this collapse in the oil price. In July 2008, oil hit $148 a barrel. Right? Then it went way down to like $35 a barrel, and now it's like $60, $65 a barrel. So that's a massive revenue loss for Russia. So the ruble collapsed and the Russian GDP collapsed by about 7 or 8% in 2009. It was one of the largest GDP, GDP falls globally as a result of the 2008 crisis. And the Russian government had built up a lot of reserves. They knew about the resource curse. They knew these things can happen, the fluctuations, so they built up big sovereign wealth fund, national reserves fund, but, and they blew about a third of that in trying to slow the pace of decline of the ruble to protect Russian, Russian borrowers. So they handled the crisis pretty well, I would say textbook well, uh, but still it was a blow to the economy. And then the, the worrying thing was that after 2010, the, the recovery bounce back never really happened. So these long-term structural inefficiencies and shortage of investment, that's what's kind of hurting them in the long run. So they managed the short run as well as could be expected, but um, it's still uh, at a turning point and they've never returned to the pre-2008 growth, growth levels. Yep. As, as early as 2013, I, I, I saw that foreign direct investment in Russia um, were about, it was about $70 billion. And I assumed a good part of that was in the energy, in the energy sector. So I guess my question is, what, is, what, what role does foreign direct investment play right now in the energy sector? How, how much of an influence, how much is, of what is happening uh, is uh, impacting um, Russia, uh, foreign direct investment impacting Russia, or, uh, or, the, or the Russia impacting the investments <coughs> themselves? Right. It, it, it's certainly down, down substantially. It's hard to unscramble the effects of the sanctions 
which are significant, but it's hard to unscramble the effect of the sanctions from the effect of the low oil price, right, which deters investment, and from the effect of the general climate of political uncertainty that, like, even aside from the sanctions, you know, the markets reacted to the Crimean I incidents independent of the sanctions because it shows that kind of Putin maybe is not in control of his military or might start a war or something. So I think the, the causes of the, 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 the plunge in foreign investment are, are multiple but um, severe. And the Russians are very keen to get foreign investment back in. Um, but you know the the Western oil companies in particular uh, are you know avoiding uh, breaching the sanctions, and then banks and other intermediaries that help companies to break the sanctions are going to get into trouble. So I think there's this period of, of a pause, and the business is is kind of hoping that the sanctions will be lifted, or the Europeans will open the, lift the sanctions, and then the business can can start again. I, I talked to a BP guy last week who said. The Rosneft were very friendly with us recently and offered us this complete brownfield site that for years we've been trying to persuade them to open to us and they'd refused and now it's like, why don't you come? So um, the Russians are trying to lure uh, business back, back in, but the, the sanctions regime is a deterrent. But what percentage of the business is, is, is influenced or controlled by foreign direct investment? It's hard to say because you know the, the official figures, the largest sources of foreign direct investment are like Cy Cyprus and the Cayman Islands and, and, and the Netherlands. And most of that's Russian money. So the Russian uh, oligarchs you know, export the money, uh, bank the revenues outside the country, and then reinvest it with better uh, legal guarantees as, as, as foreign investors. So a lot of it is recycled, uh, recycled money. Um, yeah. Uh, what impact could alternative energy sources have on Russia's energy strategy? Um, they're not worried about alternative energy sources because the price is higher than coal or, or gas. Um, so in the long term, you could, you, you could say that, yeah, if, if Europe decides that uh, gas is too expensive, um, but in the, it, there's no sign that the natural gas will get any, anywhere near that level, so natural gas is still um, a cheaper, and it's you know it's 25 percent cleaner than than uh, coal in terms of green greenhouse gases. So um, I think the shale gas revolution in the, in the U.S. has, has uh, on the one hand, it's uh, hurt Russia because it's pulled down the price of gas. On the other hand, of course, the falling price of gas prices out uh, renewables. So that, that makes it more likely that Germany, which is the most aggressive in promoting renewables, uh, the, the, the costs just pointed more towards staying with, with Russian gas. And the same is true in the, in the Asian zone, that the uh, post-Fukushima decline in nuclear energy in Japan pushed up the price of gas in the Asian market. So if it's like $5 per, uh, or even less now, 3 or $4 per thousand BTUs in the US and it's ten to twelve dollars in Europe, it's like seventeen dollars in, in Japan. So the the cost cost price uh, looks pretty favorable to, to natural gas exports despite the current downturn. So and it's long term prospects, right? Because you're building these pipelines that are going to be there for twenty years. So the long term cost projections still look very good for uh, natural gas. Just one more question, and then we have to. Um, with Saudi Arabia being Russia's main competitor in the energy market, I was wondering if the recent like ISIS revolts were helping Russia gain more <coughs> GDP in the sales of their um, energy. Yeah, if ISIS, you know, disrupts Iraqi oil production and maybe even, you know. Uh, Saudi oil production or something, then that, that pushes the global price of oil up, and so the Russian smiles are going to be uh, broader. So, uh, it, uh, yeah, that works to Russia's favor. Also, I think, referring back to the previous panel, there was also the argument often made that Russia was geopolitically taking advantage of the chaos in the Middle East to, to make the move on Ukraine, knowing that the U.S. was bogged down with Syria and Iraq, and so in that Machiavellian sense, yes, Russia is a kind of 
kind of collateral beneficiary of ISIS. But on the other hand, Russia has its own serious Islamist, Islamist terrorism problem with Dagestan and Chechnya. So Russia, as the, uh, Mr. Toby said earlier, is very interested in cooperating against Islamist terrorism on the other side. Okay. Time for one more sure. Last sure, one. Uh, could we see the decline, the recent decline in oil prices going together with the sanctions against Russia? It's, it's kind of a punishment of Russia. Uh, you and mean then, the Saudi, Saudi plot kind of thing to push down? Well, American pressure on the Saudi and then several. Yeah. Um, and then actually working out in Ukraine by <coughs> they certainly, yeah, Putin backed off. You know, the Russian nationalists wanted Putin to do a lot more in Ukraine than he did. So the nationalists are split over whether you, Putin is, is a real nationalist or not. It was funny at the Valdai Club last November, Putin said, I am the biggest Russian nationalist, you know. Uh, the point being that some Russian nationalists think that he isn't. So that was kind of hot. But uh, my own take on the, the Saudi pushing the price down is that the main... Uh, target was the U.S. shale uh, and other forms of tight oil production and the tar sands. I think they wanted to price out those because uh, those cost, you know, $55, $60 a barrel to produce. So if the price is down at $60 a barrel, those, uh, those uh, fields are not going to be developed. So my own take is the Saudis didn't care about the Russians and didn't have anything against Putin particularly. That, was, that wasn't their problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.